Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session in the living room brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. If you're watching this live, you can join in the conversation via YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, if you send in a question, please presage it with hashtag Curzon Living Room and let us know where you're writing from. This afternoon, I'm delighted to welcome the two stars of Military Wives, Chris and Scott Thomas, and Sharon Horgan. Hello to you both. Hello. Hi. Um, we, we normally presage uh, these conversations by um, letting everyone know where you are. Are you both currently in London or are you somewhere else around the world? No, I'm, I'm so lucky. I'm in the middle of, um, I'm in the middle of the countryside in England. I'm in an attic in Hackney. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> um, okay, I, we've already had a lot of questions coming in uh, for you both, but um, I've got one that I thought a lot of people might want to ask. And that's about tainted love. Is there ever, or was there ever a scenario in the film where you actually shot a scene where you sang this together? And if so, will we be able to ever see it? <laughs> Sadly, no. <laughs> we should do it though for when it comes out on DVD and have it as a, you know, sort of a, a, an extras situation. Yeah. I, I'm not going to put you under any pressure to sing it a cappella now. So, so we'll move on. Um, I want to get your reaction of, of um, when you first received the script for this film, um, what was it that, that attracted you? Kristen, start with you. Um, well, I just, I really like the story of uh, the people who are left behind, um, you know, are, are basically sort of locked into this, uh, this place, into the, this military base and are, are sort of waiting for their fate to be decided rather like what we're doing at the moment, I suppose. Um, and then the whole aspect of the, the it was so playful, the script was so, such fun, it was incredibly moving. And at the same time, it was really fun and um, playful. And I love the idea of singing. I just found that really attractive. And I knew how, I, well, actually I subsequently discovered how popular um, Gareth Malone's um, choir had been and how, how many people had really enjoyed watching that and following that on, on television. And I thought that that would just be, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to take that a little bit, just a little bit further and turn it into a fiction. Sure. Oh, well, I mean, I think it, it, it made me cry, like even in, in the, the original script that we were sent and it had lots and lots of rewrites after that, but I just thought, oh, this could be, um, one of those films that is, you know, emotional, but because like Kristen was saying, there was, it's playful. Um, it felt like it could sort of be, um, you know, that just the kind of thing that, that would make great family viewing as well. Cause I'm, I'm used to doing things that are just a little bit sort of um, darker and a bit sort of spikier and there's this spike in there. And I think, you know, also I knew that Kristen was, hopefully going to be doing it. And also I, I, like, I loved um, what Peter did um, with the full Monty. You know, he, he can take situations like that that would be maudlin in someone else's hands, but actually he's quite good at finding the real, you know, the real version of who those people are. And, um, and yeah, the singing. I, I liked I liked the sort of odd couple sort of buddy thing at the heart of it. And, and I, I really love the idea of doing that with Kristen. Um, but yeah, the songs, and even when we read the script first, it was different songs and we kind of knew that they would change because it's always tricky, you know, you have to get rights and all that kind of thing. So we kind of thought if they get the right songs, this could just be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So Sharon, I don't know if this, this is apocryphal, but um, I'd, I'd read somewhere that I wasn't sure if it was director Peter Catania or one of the producers who approached you about the role and you said, I can't sing. And they said, well, what about Pierce Brosnan? Is, is that true or? <laughs> no, that was just my stupid joke. Um, you know, I was basically going, well, I can't sing. Why do you, it was kind of like, why do you, why do you want me to do it? You know, thinking, um, you know, they'd made a mistake. Um, and then I, I was tweeting about it and my stupid joke was, you know, well, Pierce Brosnan did Mamma Mia and he couldn't sing and it didn't matter. But actually it, it, it doesn't matter because the, the real story is about a bunch of, you know, women who aren't trained singers. And I think for Peter, I mean, of course we had to some, have some good singers in there and they were, but on, on the whole, he wanted it to, to be a learning curve, you know, for them to start with 
very little skill, but just a sort of a desire to find something that sort of takes their mind off what's happening in, in Afghanistan. And over the course of the thing, it becomes a lifeline. Like I said, you know, they really need it. They really are able to just focus on this and, and they realize that they're, they're, they're better together. And, and, and you don't need to be a good singer to have that. And in actual fact, you do sound better together, even if, even if you have very poor skills. Um, but we got better. I mean, you know, we had a, we had training, we had each other. Yeah, we got so much better, and um, and it, it was uh, that that in itself was actually quite exciting. You know, um, uh, pretending you're a choir, actually being a choir, um, and 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 sort of and things improving every time we did it. It was just a little bit better, and um, it. I think what what's great about the film is the idea in the beginning that you can't. That it's something you can't do and that you manage to overcome it and you manage to to to, to do something you never imagined that you were able to do and I think that that's what's that's what's that's what's really encouraging about the film you mentioned a moment ago Sharon about the fact that um, things change the songs change um, I'm curious with Roseanne Flynn and Rachel Tunnard's script uh, were they on set because the thing that really comes across in the film is the incredible rapport between all the actors and I just yeah. wonder if they were on set and started reacting to that and some improvisation might have changed certain scenes? Well, we, um, Kristen and I were very um, lucky in that we were sort of um, brought in at, you know, the sort of, I'd say, second or third to last script before it became the, the script that, that got shot. And so we were really um, keen that it sounded as, as sort of real and natural as possible. And they were very, you know, wel welcoming, um, you know, for our ideas and stuff. And, but also I think, and, Ra and Rachel actually was on, on set um, quite a lot. She, she did the sort of later um, drafts of it. And so we we're always sort of adjusting it as we went, but in actual fact, like not talking about myself and Kristen, but it, it is a casting thing. Like those, those, those girls who, who, who play those roles, they were just brilliantly cast. And they were also an amazing bunch of fun, lovely women so that kind of just that natural kind of you know chemistry is, is there because because of them because they just sort of had it together and we, we kind of we were thrown in at the deep end because of the singing like we had a couple of sort of sessions together and that was our rehearsal and that was that was that just created the the chemistry sort of naturally because we, we we were all scared we all knew we had to learn this thing. We all wanted it to get better. And, and that wasn't that it, Kristen. It was kind of just being together for those moments initially. It was, it was, it was proper fun. Um, but I think uh, we, were, we were lucky in that, that um, Rachel is incredibly collaborative and not, um, you know, and, and was interested to find out what we felt we wanted to say. And, um, and Pete as well, you know, very um, generous um, and, and trusting. And so we were able, there wasn't much improv, but it was, we, we, it was between, loose. Between you and me anyway, it was mostly quite, quite thought out actually, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Even if that was sort of at the last minute. <laughs> uh -huh. But in those, in those scenes where we're with the girls and we're, you know, sort of standing up the top and that those first sort of scenes, where oh, yeah. we're, you know, I mean, that was kind of, that had a sort of looseness to it because we, you know, yeah. We didn't know what the other one was going to do, really. I mean, obviously, we had the script and we had the words, but in terms of our, you know, body language and how we'd react to each other and how they would react to us, that all just sort of, you know, that was quite organic. Yeah. I've got a question from Joan in Bath, uh, Kristen. Um, you come from a military family. W was that any help in any way in creating the role that you play? Well, it, 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 a little bit, because um, I, for instance, I'd grown up, I'd spent part of my childhood, not in my entire childhood, but I'd spent part of my childhood on, on one of those military bases in a house, just like the little houses that we see. Um, and so it was, I sort of knew the basics like that and the feeling of all being together and being in a, in a very um, tightly knit community. Um, so I knew about that. And I knew, of course, I knew about the risks um, that you know these families take uh, being um, loving someone who is um, is uh, putting their lives at risk every day for the country. Um, you know, I know what that feels. Yeah, I know what that feels like. Yeah. And in terms of uh, research, 
did you both go out and meet, uh, if not the military wives, perhaps members of, of the choirs that appeared in the TV series? Well, I met Eugenie Tomlin, um, who was the was was in the original choir, and um, pinched her entire wardrobe, <laughs> uh, um, and we we chatted a bit about that. I was very interested in in military life um, because it was I, I just you know that that was really what was mostly interesting to me. And the choir sort of, I, I felt that the choir would happen by itself, um, which in fact it did. Um, because as, as we were saying earlier, you know, with, um, with Sharon, with the other girls, uh, um, you know, we gradually got better and I thought I could hold a tune quite well actually. And um, just like the character and found out quite rapidly, this was not the case. <laughs> That's not true. Um, there was also lots of, um, you know, um, in, in the background and stuff, there were um, military wives and stuff. And in the houses that we were filming him, it, filming in, and in the um, houses that we were sort of spending time in, you know, kind of resting in and stuff, um, one of the um, ladies who owned the house that I was hanging out in, she had two teenage daughters and she was in a very sort of similar situation to, um, uh, to Lisa. So it was really, um, was really enlightening and 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 really I think it really um, really helped um, meeting them. We didn't really meet the the choir ladies until the the premiere until we sort of got on that sort of publicity uh, train and they are just infectious. They're brilliant. They're they're a great old bunch. I've got a question from Rachel Watts in Derby, and she asks, um, was Gareth Malone, the person behind the choir, ever involved in an advisory capacity? I don't know. I don't think so. I can't. He was there at the premiere, and he was yeah. great crack. He was brilliant. Um, he's so lovely. I don't I don't know if he was. Christian, was he ad advising on it? I don't, I don't think he wanted to, or he would, he'd moved on to something else, or... I'm not sure. I, I'm. I'm sure he must have been consulted. And must have been asked to be part of it. But um. yeah, we had Lauren Balfe there a lot. I mean, he was on. You know, our, our composer. He he was. You know, very um, involved um, across the whole thing. So we we had really experienced. Uh, and Jenny, who was our our vocal coach, and so we were surrounded by people who knew what they were doing. Thank God. I've got two questions here from West London. First of all, Jane from Richmond, what's the most challenging aspect of working on this film? Sharon, let's keep, stay with you. Oh, well, I mean, this is gonna sound really uh, uh, brattish, but it was just, we never had any lunch. <laughs> Andrew, we, we had so much to do in such a short amount of time. We had five weeks to shoot that film. And we, we did like, we got three um, pickup days at the end, but it was so much to do. And there was such an enormous um, ensemble cast. And on top of that, there was another whole realm of, of cast who, who made up, you know, the sort of um, the larger choir. So the amount of filming and, and coverage that that entailed. And on top of that, when you add earpieces and, and sound and like people who are bad at playing the keyboard and, you know, like just the, the, the amount of time all of that took up, there was no, it was just constant continuous days. And I think, like, thank God we all really liked each other and liked the film. And that was sort of what got us through it. But it was very sort of exhausting. And, but you know what? I'd love, I wish I was doing it now. I what know. I would give to be in a room full of women singing right now. Kristen, what about you? Um, well, I think what was challenging, I mean, there were obviously the, the technical challenges of um, actually singing, which I find quite scary. Um, but, and the, um, and 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 the, the time issue, which was quite serious, um, but there was also another thing for me, which is the getting trying to get the balance right between being sort of in charge and um, and allowing the the, the 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 vulnerability of this character to 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 sort of come through the cracks. Um, that was quite difficult to get right. Um, because of the schedule that we had because we were sort of all over the place and so it was quite difficult to sort of sew it all keep it all in one piece yeah yeah because it was all shot out of sequence i mean the one Not great thing that yeah 
so it's kind of hard to sort of keep your where you're at in your head but yeah. um one good thing was that we got to film those albert hall scenes at the very end which was good because by then we really did know each other very well and we were sort of tighter as a, as a choir you know and we had done that thing that peter wanted like improved over, over time so i mean that was that was good that was and, well planned and also, and also as you mentioned before being on the base being up in yorkshire on the base was also really really helpful because you've got this you've got this sort of atmosphere of being enclosed which was um something we hadn't yet discovered <laughs> yeah yeah no, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something I find really interesting when you watch a film. You, the the tone can seem seamless to an audience, but then you find out a film wasn't shot in chronological order. Yeah. Um, it's not so easy necessarily to work out the tone. I know Peter has gone to great lengths to say this film is not a comedy, um, but it is a film that has a lot of laughs in it. It's also incredibly moving. How easy did you both find it to to find that balance of tone? throughout the whole whole film because there are moments that are incredibly emotional mm. and then we're laughing the next minute mm. but i think that's often often the way isn't it that, that, you, that you that you tip quite suddenly into um i think that's a very particular there's a very particularly british thing of being um finding sort of humor in and the in awfulness in in fear or or whatever and I think that that was that was very much in the writing as well in the first place yeah. you know and the kind of man Peter is you know yeah yeah and and in and in you know there, there was a there was a, a real mixture of you know in in, in the ensemble uh, choir there was a real mixture of um you know actors who had done comedy or drama or came from yeah. theater or, or tv and so I think that helped with finding that tone and, and like Kristen said, it was, you know, it, it was in the writing and, and in Peter, you know, not not sort of not wanting to overdo it when it was emotional, not sort of, you know, he definitely liked to find find the laughs, uh, which we do as well. And I think it's just, uh, I don't know, I think it kind of comes down to sort of um, just <laughs> common sense, you know, or or like taste and stuff. You kind of you kind of you hopefully sort of know you can hopefully just sort of figure it out where where you don't want to push it or where you think it does need a laugh or you know you can find those sort of moments and as long as you're as long as you're you know there's someone with a safe pair of hands at the helm you're you're usually in a in a good place but i don't know whether you agree sharon but i found that however dark the moments were that we were you know in the story and well however sort of however um kind of sad it got for the characters we were playing it never once got into that really sometimes you make a film and, and you're you're playing something really down and really dark and it's and the whole atmosphere just sort of sinks yeah always an atmosphere of there was a sort of joy in it somehow. yeah um, yeah that's, that's, that's it I, yeah i think and, it's and the, in fact, we had no time again this time thing you just yeah. didn't have time to kind of think, oh, you know, here we go again. It was just like, you had to just keep it going, keep it going, keep it going all the time. A bit like working your way through a really sad song. <laughs> you can't stop and think, oh God, this is so sad. You've just got to keep going. But that that's kind of what the, like when we spoke to the the, the wives after, when, you know, the, the, the military wives and, and the choir, that's what they sort of um, picked up on the most, you know, because really you do have to just carry on. And there, there's a sense of sort of su support and camaraderie that, that, that happens sort of naturally uh, amongst that, that group of women. And it sort of happened, you know, with, with us a lot as well. And, and I think that's why it never really, you know, when it got dark, it just had to lift up again because that's what those, those women do for each other. Listen, a second question from West London, John from Putney. You and Gary Oldman give two of the best performances I've seen in years in Darkest Hour. You're brilliant again here. How do you go about choosing your roles? <laughs> um, blindfold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. That's very, very kind of you to say that. Um, I, I really, 
I don't know. I think it's just instinct. It's instinct about what you've done recently, about what you want to do next. It's there's not really a huge amount of planning that goes into it. It's just sometimes something arrives on your desk and you sort of fall in love with it. And this is what happened with this project. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Military Wives, um, you know, I the first time I was sent it, um, it sort of got pushed to, because there was something else sort of happening instead. And so, it, and then I, uh, about, Six months later, I said to my agent, what happened to that film about the, the military wives and the choir? And so then it, it came back up again because that was something that had sort of resonated in me. And I thought that actually that was a really lovely story. So, you know, you just find things that are, um, which for whatever reason, it could be a geographical reason, you know, you want, you don't want to leave home at the moment. You want to make a film that's local. It can be as, as silly as that, but um, there are always, there's always something there that that sort of is intriguing and maybe a bit dangerous or a bit funny or a bit generous or something that that corresponds with what I'm going through in my own life. Um, obviously, because you know you spend so much of your time making films, um, they have to be important enough to actually get out there and do them. Um, I had a similar question from Emma, but she adds at the end, um, she can't think of a better Mrs. Danvers to appear in the new version of Rebecca. Have you finished filming that now? We have. I'm not quite sure how to take that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did enjoy it enormously, I have to say. I think take it as a compliment. Um, <laughs> I've got Jen from just around the corner from you, uh, Sharon, uh, who says you're a brilliant writer. Is it ever a challenge working as an actor with other people's writing? Um, well, I mean, not on something like this, when you're like very generously um, involved, you know, and, and your, your, your opinions are kind of um, taken on board. But actually, I, I really, uh, I really enjoy it because it, it's like a busman's holiday. I think when it's, when it's something um, I've written myself, I, you, you just don't switch off. And, you know, even, even things I've written that I'm in, I'm kind of constantly thinking about something else we, we had this really uh, funny edit of catastrophe once which we only we only sort of noticed it at the last minute but it was a scene where uh, another actor Michaela Watkins was you know doing her bit and I was in the background supposed to be you know in character watching her and we realized I was mouthing her lines <laughs> and uh, we, we honestly because I was in the background it was a last minute sort of notice like, oh my god so it's very hard to sort of switch off and not um just concentrate on what you're doing and that that's that's what's lovely about doing um someone else's um uh piece you know you can just do that thing you can just concentrate on acting and it's a lovely it's a lovely thing to get to do I've got a great question from Robin who says you're both fantastic together. We've had too many men in buddy movies, not to mention the Laurel and Hardy's and Abbott Costellos of the world. Can't you two create your own buddy franchise together? <laughs> yeah, we're going to do, I'm going to get her. Once all this awfulness is over. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think a cop uh, double act would be great. I just don't know how to write cop shows. Maybe I can find out. Maybe I can learn that skill. I, 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 this is not the right place to pitch it, but I'm just thinking a London up-to-date version of Cagney and Lacey would go down a treat. Okay, yeah. well, I'm permanently pregnant. I'm just always pregnant in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm seeing Kristen nodding there, so perhaps this could be a thing. I think, I think, um, Let's do it. <laughs> um, Kristen, I've, I've actually just been texted an email by a friend um, who says, um, Sally Ann says, two of my favourite films are leaving and I've loved you so long. Would you talk about the differing attitudes to women's sexuality on screen that you've experienced working in both European and US stroke UK cinema? Oh, well, I think it's all changed now again, isn't it? Um, uh, well, I've, I've been around long enough to see attitudes change enormously um, all over. Um, I think, I, I don't really feel qualified to answer that right now. I just, I feel like I've sort of given up on um, on thinking about that because I always seem to get it wrong. Um, we, when we made, um, when we made I've Loved You So Long or um, Leaving, that was very, it was, it was very um, thrilling for a lot of women to be able to see um, a love interest, a romantic love interest, somebody who was, 
the the object of you know, sexual desire um, to be an older person, even though I was, you know, I can't, I don't know, what was I? I can't remember how old I was, 40, 48 or something, which is hardly very old. Um, but, um, you know, now, what, I, what is interesting to see is how many more um, stories there are about older people um, around. Um, and what, when I say older, I mean like in the 60s and 70s. Um, and you're seeing far more stories about couples at that age than you were, say, 20 years ago. Um, but I don't know whether that's because my interest has changed. So I'm not, I'm not looking at film. I'm looking at films of people of generations nearer to me than watching films about basically children. <laughs> um, so I know I'm more interested in people who are in their fifties and sixties than I am in their twenties. But I, I don't know. I don't know what the difference are, what differences are now. I think on, in one respect, we're far more open and in another respect, we're far more, um, you know, sort of uh, careful and tread very, very lightly, and um, we avoid we avoid issues like crazy now. I think. Sharon, I I wouldn't want a group um, a whole um, bunch of different writers together, but there's you currently working, um, Rosanna, Rachel. We've got Nicole Taylor who did Wild Rose, Rebecca Frain who wrote Misbehaviour. From your perspective. Do you feel that there's been uh, a shift perhaps in, in recent years, or do you think there's still a big up, uphill climb in terms of gender representation and certainly parity? Oh, oh well, there's, it's both of those things. I mean, there's uh, been a, a massive shift, but it's still, um, it, we're nowhere near any kind of um, parity. Um, I think there's been a shift because, um, you know, women started um, getting the opportunity to write more and to, um, you know, be be the author and to, um, you know, write and direct. And um, so therefore you had a lot more kind of female stories. It just, just made sense. And there's sort of a, you know, a trickle down effect from that. Um, but, and, al and also a, lo a lot of those um, shows and films were very successful and it all, you know, it's down to economics in the end, isn't it? If, if those, films and TV shows are doing well and getting audiences, it's, you know, that will continue. Um, but, but, you know, it's still, unfortunately, I mean, I'm not really good at retaining statistics, um, but I, I, I know that the um, amount of, um, you know, female led films, certainly like studio films or, or blockbusters or, or that kind of thing is, you know, it's heavily um, weighted in favor of the male storyteller. But you know, it's for sure improving and, and which is great because the landscape is for sure more interesting, you know. Um, and if that hadn't happened, I don't know what we'd be doing. We'd be watching and, and listening uh, to, the, to the same stories retold in, in, in different ways, you know. So it's great. It's very, very exciting. It's just, uh, you know, it's a situation that you can't, um, you can't be lax about. You can't take your foot off the pedal because everything will just sort of slide back. Oh, um, I know we're currently on lockdown and the film industry, like like everything else, um, is pretty inactive. But you both, I believe, have film projects that you're planning on directing. What stages are you at with them and how soon, once we all get back to work, will you be uh, starting them? Sharon, let's start with you. Uh, well, I think we're probably on our 10th uh, draft <laughs> of, um, of the, the film that I'm directing. Um, we were just about to start um, location scouting um, when, when just before lockdown happened. I mean, seriously, like two weeks. And um, and in fact, in Ireland, it had happened quicker, and that's where we were looking to do some um, location um, scouting. So, yeah, at the moment, it's it's everyone is is in this weird um, limbo, right? Everyone's just sort of uh, waiting. I mean, it's definitely a time that could prove to be very uh, fruitful. You know, there's a lot of time to write and and to develop and that kind of thing, but. At the same time, everyone's so distracted. Like I'm, you know, with what's going on in the world that it, it I don't know, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but yeah. Um, lots of drafts down the line, and but yeah, we're obviously we can't move, not for a while. And what about you, Kristen? Well, I've moved on from that because I just couldn't get, I couldn't, um, I couldn't get 
the I couldn't get the script to where I wanted it to be. So I, I've, I've moved on from that one. Um, hopefully, something else will show up. Um, I'm afraid we have come to the end of this event. Military-wise, if you've not actually seen it yet, it's available for online streaming from Curzon Home Cinema. If you have not seen Catastrophe, uh, well, I'll start again. If you've not seen Catastrophe, um, then shame on you, first of all, but you can catch up with it on Fawn Demand. And also, if you have not seen Christine in her brilliant performance in Series 2 of Fleabag, you can see that on iPlayer. Um, thank you both of you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Lillian. Nice talking to you. And you too. Bye bye. And with regards to the next Living Room event that's going to take place this Tuesday, the 21st of April, it will be following a screening, if you want to tune in just before uh, the Q&A, of Sulphur and White. And I will be in discussion with the writer, the director, two of the actors from the film, and also the person who inspired um, the film. So please do join us at 8.30 for Sulphur and White Q&A on Tuesday night. Take care. Bye-bye.